today's sitting. Members, do we have any questions? Well, there was a dead heat, <laughs> but uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the extremely low rental vacancies rate and the number of Western Australians moving home due to COVID, which is putting further pressure on housing. And I ask, what is the forecast increase in the number of homeless when your government's moratorium on evictions and rents increases, rental increases ends in March? Minister. Um, the question, uh, that the specific question that the Leader of the Opposition has asked me uh, is about the forecasting of the number of homeless in regard to uh, the um, moratorium we have now on evictions. Um, actually, in, uh, th there, is no, there is no specific forecast in relation to homeless people. Uh, we, don't, um, we don't keep that data now and, as far as I know nationally, there are no um, data sets which project the number of homeless people. In fact, one of the reforms that we've got in place in Western Australia is to have Data, better data collection in relation to homelessness in Western Australia. Uh, in fact, a lot of the data that we rely on now is either census-driven, which of course has a lag in it, or uh, is, as a, is uh, a result of um, homeless counts that local governments, sometimes with cooper in cooperation, do um, in the metropolitan area or in regional centres. So one of the reforms that we've put in place in regard to the homelessness strategy, which um, I think is, uh, will, will stand us in good stead, but I do note, um, Leader of the Opposition, that your opposition spokesperson has, um, has dismissed and said was a waste of time, uh, is that we need to have better data collection in relation to homeless in Western Australia, including a tracking of those people who need our support, and that's part of the work that we're doing. Uh, in regard to the economic forecasts of what is likely to happen uh, to housing supply, uh, people on the public housing waiting list, the social housing waiting list, and in fact the private rentals in Western Australia, um, uh, it, it is something that, that uh, government is looking at, but I, I do notice that we have um, the Treasury here, we have the Housing Minister uh, as well, so perhaps that is a, a question that you could um, best direct to them. Uh, we have been working very closely with the community sector to make sure those people who are homeless or at risk of being homeless are supported at this time, and that includes from around the state. Uh, so work is being done in regional areas with remote Aboriginal communities to make sure that people are supported at this time uh, during COVID and those communities are still, in, uh, are still being protected uh, against uh, too much traffic in and out um, at this stage. So uh, uh, I can assure that the Leader of the Opposition and the House um, that we're very mindful of what will happen to vulnerable people at the end of the moratorium. Um, but given um, the challenges that we've faced as a state government in relation to COVID, uh, we uh, know that we're in the best position, uh, both in terms of jobs, um, the movement of people around the state, and in fact, protecting against community transmission of COVID uh, of any state in the country. Thank you, Ms. Uh, supplementary. Oh. Minister for Water. Oh, thanks. The Good Minister advice. did a very good answer. Don't spoil it. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. D do you uh, share the concerns of the sector that the sector has about the worsening homelessness crisis uh, once the moratorium on rental increases and evictions is lifted? And are you confident an additional 2,600 public houses over a decade is going to be adequate? to serve the needs of the homelessness. There was a lot of preamble there. Are you happy to take that question, Minister? Um, Mr Speaker, it, it wasn't interesting as a supplementary Treasurer. question because there was a whole lot of new information in there. But 
Uh, look, I can, be, I can assure uh, the House as well as the public that we're working very closely with the community sector, not only to reform our current homelessness system, which is something that the, that the other side, uh, including uh, the Leader of the Opposition, uh, played no role on, at, in, at all while you were in government. In fact, I remember your contribution, uh, Leader of the Opposition, uh, was to say that the community sector was paid to do a job and they should do it. That's, that was your contribution when Members. you were asked uh, about um, the City of Perth's response to homelessness uh, um, in, in their precinct. Member uh, we're working Kareem. very closely. Not your question. We're, very, we're working very closely on our housing first approach, the best evidence available to, for long term outcomes for those people who are currently homeless, to reform the system through no wrong door, uh, the by name list and the like, so the back of house reform to make sure that our homelessness people uh, are best served, uh, to put new resources into a system that we put in uh, over $90 million a year uh, into now. And we've Upped that, uh, we've increased that state contribution to include uh, over $70 million this time uh, last year. We announced through Housing First and the building of two common grounds. So I'm confident that we are not only do doing our bit as a state government to address this issue, but also working with the community sector. Um, I'd be interested to hear from, from you, Leader of the Opposition, what, your what you did when you were in government in relation to homelessness. Not much. And um, for people like yourself and the, lead, and the member for Corrine, who are, are born member again, for Corrine. who are born again when it comes to understanding and being, and being concerned about the homeless, in fact, in eight and a half years in government, did very little. Members. very, very little. And so, member for Wanneroo, you can't ever Mr. comment Speaker, on everything. I'm very proud Maybe of the engagement that we've had with the sector, the support that we've. Um, that we've given the, the community sector, the policy work that we've done, and the extra resources that we are, um, have brought into the effort to address homelessness, not only the crisis response, but long-term sustainable solutions for Western Australia. Members, before I forget, in the Speaker's Gallery today, I've got my uh, daughter, Sarah, and my granddaughter, Emily. Emily wants to be a Member of Parliament, and I have to watch... <laughs> <laughs> oh, membership for no. Well, she's a lot brighter than a lot of people in this chamber at the moment. Um, I didn't say where I was looking. Uh, so where are we? The member for Gilroy. We'll try not to put them off. Um, my question is to the treasurer. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's long and hard fight in securing a fair share of the GST for Western Australia, and I ask. Can the Treasurer outline to the House how the GST reform secured by this government is delivering a fair and sustainable outcome? And can the Treasurer outline what this government's message is to the Liberals in New South Wales and their attempts to overturn the reforms to the distribution of the GST? Mr Speaker, Treasurer. Mr. Speaker my message isn't just to the Liberals in New South Wales, but Liberals anywhere. Mr Speaker, because this is one of the great reforms that this government managed to achieve not long after coming into government in 2017, Mr Speaker. And since we did that reform uh, to make our GST distribution fair and sustainable, I must admit I've been keeping an eagle eye mainly on South Australia and Tasmania, who I thought might come at us for another go, maybe the territories, because the Commonwealth has basically put in uh, all the GST money to support them and withdrawn the Commonwealth support for the territories. I didn't think it would come so early from New South Wales, Mr Speaker. And I want to make this point very, very clear. New South Wales has not lost one cent in GST revenue as a result of the reform that we successfully implemented with the Commonwealth Government. Not one cent, Mr Speaker. What this is, is the New South Wales Government trying to blame one of the most significant reforms for Western Australia on their diabolical budget management, Mr yeah. Speaker. That's all they are trying to do here. That disgrace that is the New South Wales budget. We've now got the Premier saying, actually, it's all because of Western Australia, despite the fact that Western Australia, all this reform we've done, 
to get a fair and sustainable outcome for Western Australia simply means we get 70 per cent of our GST. And I remind the House currently New South Wales is sitting on 91.8 per cent of their GST revenue, Mr Speaker. So to give you some ideas, to give you some ideas, over the last decade Members. that has been, through GST revenue alone, a subsidy from Western Australian taxpayers of $30 billion to the, to the other states and territories of Australia. And even with our reform, Mr Speaker, even with our reform over the next decade, that subsidy is going to be in the order of about $16 billion. So there's no way that the reform that this government managed to achieve with the Commonwealth Government is in any way unfair or any way unsustainable. I want to remind uh, members, this is what the New South Wales Premier is saying is unfair. If we went back to the old system, because ultimately it's driven by royalties, as most people in this place will know, under the old system, we would have to raise about nearly $10 billion in royalty revenue to keep $1 billion. That's what Gladys Berejiklian and the Premier of New South Wales are saying is fair. That's what she wants to go back to, Mr Speaker. But there is no way, no way, that the McGowan Labor government is going to cop this. There is no way the people of Western Australia is going to cop this. If New South Wales are going to increase their net debt projections by a factor of 300 per cent, own your decision. And I do note that it's not revenue write-downs driving that, Mr Speaker. There are a range of very large budget blowouts that have been covered off uh, in the New South Wales budget as a result of that, Mr Speaker. But this is uh, the disgrace that is the New South Wales budget. The capitulation on financial management is in no way the result of the GST arrangement that we successfully negotiated with the Commonwealth Government. And I'm going to finish this point. The New South Wales budget has not lost one cent as a result of the GST deal that we did with the Commonwealth Government. Not one cent. And I say to New South Wales, own your decisions, own your budgets, because Western Australia is not going to cop that for one minute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, member for Bateman. We outline to the House the forecast number of Western Australian small businesses expected to close once JobKeeper ends in March. Uh, member, you're asking for an opinion. Um, I'm happy to give it. OK, Treasurer. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Oh, I, Mr Speaker, as my time comes to an end, I'm always happy to opine. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you for the question, Member for Bateman, uh, about a Commonwealth policy. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll make some comments on the, on, the, on the Commonwealth Government's policy of JobKeeper, which I think has been an extraordinary success. And when you look back in time, I suspect the adoption of a right, by a right-wing government to one of the most significant left-wing policies Australia has seen really has been quite significant. JobKeeper and JobSeeker will be historically important in the sweep of policy uh, in Australia. And I think the fact that we have one of the most left-wing Commonwealth governments in Western Australia's, his, in Australia's history highlights the fact that I understand that connection to work is fundamental. Connection to work is fundamental. I've said in this place dozens of times, I suspect, since the coronavirus restrictions started to impact the jobs market, Mr Speaker. Whether you are the Governor of the Reserve Bank or any Treasurer in, in Australia, it's all about keeping people connected to work. And that's exactly what the policy around JobKeeper uh, was designed to do. I think it has been successful. I think the unemployment rates in Australia would have been significantly higher. But for JobKeeper, I think we can all recall those early days of those horrible images of Australians, Western Australians, in lines outside of Centrelink. The design of JobKeeper was to stop that, and it worked. Now, as I've said, going into these sorts of, these sorts of supports, uh, are much easier than coming out, which is why you've seen the Commonwealth Government make a range of changes over the last little while around rates of job seeker and job keeper, but also the transition out. Ultimately, the impacts on individual businesses, uh, member for Bateman, I suspect you know, uh, will be subject to the economy at the time, uh, and we'll see how that works. But ultimately, I wouldn't be surprised if in some form job keeper continues beyond March. But there will be clearly an impact, uh, because ultimately that has to transition out, which is why uh, the Premier and I and Ministers have uh, had a $5.5 billion recovery spend, Mr Speaker. That is designed to dovetail in off the back of the withdrawal of JobKeeper and JobSeeker to keep Western Australians 
in jobs to keep businesses operating, Mr Speaker, and that's why I think yesterday the Premier outlined a whole suite of support that we have given to the small business sector of Western Australia. Uh, so, Mr Speaker, uh, what the Commonwealth projects on their own policy is up to them. What we will do as a state is ensure that our policies align with what their announced intentions are, and our $5.5 billion recovery program certainly does that. Supplementary. If you're forecasting an average unemployment rate of 8 per cent this year, what is the number of workers in small business forecast to become unemployed once JobKeeper ends in March, and what impact will, have, and what impact will that have on the unemployment rate? Treasurer. On 8 per cent unemployment rate, what's the rate now? 6.7 per cent. Thank you. Gee whiz, Minister for Tourism, you've been listening. So that highlights the fact that, highlights the fact that we are actually, our economy has been more resilient than even we expected back in May when we, were, when we were responding to the coronavirus. And you can giggle, the way, you can giggle all you like. You giggle all you like. You giggle all you like. But the fact of the matter is, and this, this, the fact that this makes you this somewhat disgruntled member for Bateman reflects poorly on you. The fact that the unemployment rate is lower than we thought it might be is a good thing. It is a good thing because we want to ensure that Western Australians are able to stay in work. And if what is interesting is that the participation rate is now back to uh, basically back to pre-COVID levels. Our labour force is back to pre-COVID COVID levels and an unemployment rate of 6.7 per cent. That is a good outcome. That is a good outcome, Liberal Party. You should celebrate this. You should celebrate the resilience of the Western Australian economy. Because when I became Treasurer, and I was on the back of four years of recession, domestic recession, under the former Liberal government, we had to get growth going again. And who would have thought that even with that June quarter, that 6% contraction in the June quarter, we still delivered economic growth across the 1920 year. You know why that is? Because we did the work early in the term of the McGowan Labor government. That's why the balance sheet's strong. That's why the economy is doing much better than we thought it would be uh, back in May, and that's why Western Australians, I suspect, in just a few months, when they go to uh, when they go to the polls, they'll say to themselves, "Will I risk a Liberal national government?" And I'm pretty sure I know the answer. Member Southern River. <laughs> Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier, and I refer to the New South Wales Liberal Party's campaign to rip up. The fair deal to the GST distribution the McGowan Labor government has worked hard to secure, and I ask the Premier, can the Premier outline to the House why the McGowan Labor government will stand up for Western Australia and fight any attempts by the Liberal Party to overturn the hard-fought reforms to the GST distribution? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I was in the Parliament in 1999. Members. Uh, when uh, the then Liberal state and federal governments signed us up to the GST deal, Mr Speaker. And that deal, of course, uh, for the next 20 years, ripped money away from Western Australia and sent it east uh, in large amounts, as the Treasurer has just outlined. And then we learned yesterday, or today, uh, that the New South Wales government, in their actual budget documents, have a breakout box. And their breakout box details how all the problems for New South Wales are because Western Australia is getting GST money. And that's to blame for the situation that New South Wales finds it in. The facts of the matter is this, Mr Speaker. New South Wales is getting 92 cents in the dollar. 92 cents in the dollar. Western Australia is getting 70 cents in the dollar. Yet somehow in the tortured imagination of the Liberal Party in New South Wales, that is unfair. That is unfair. And for some reason, the Liberal Party over there seems to think they can blame Western Australia. They can blame Western Australia. And we heard the Shadow Treasurer. He endorses many of the New South Wales Liberal Party's policies, Mr Speaker. Uh, we do know that. I'll come to that later on if he, uh, if he asks me a question, Mr Speaker. So somehow in the tortured and fevered imaginations of the New South Wales Cabinet, uh, Western Australia has an unfair advantage, Mr Speaker, because we get 70 cents in the dollar and they get 92 cents in the dollar, Mr Speaker. The reason our economy is doing strong, which the New South Wales government bemoans, uh, is because we have managed COVID well, we have got our economy back and we made sure upon coming to government we put a proper, put a proper footing uh, and Members under our Bateman, economy, I'll Mr call Speaker. You for the first so time. what we find, what we find, is ABS weekly, payroll payrolls, ABS weekly payroll jobs data, Western Australia leads the economy. We're back to basically 99.6% of all work recovered. 
uh, since, uh, uh, since uh, COVID hit the state, Mr Speaker, leading the country. Uh, internet job vacancies, highest since March 2013. Retail figures, strongest year-on-year -year growth in the, in the country. Uh, highest um, uh, land development, land sales, building approvals. Uh, we've got FIFO workers moving in their thousands to Western Australia, Mr Speaker, uh, and uh, we're the only economy in the country that didn't go into recession. All the other states went into recession, not Western Australia, Mr Speaker. Now, New South Wales, run by the Liberal Party, they sold off nearly everything. Uh, their debt is now heading to $104 billion, and they have a $16 billion deficit, Mr Speaker, whilst this government delivers a $1.2 billion surplus, which again the Liberal Party complains about, Mr yeah. Speaker. Uh, we undertook responsible financial management. Industry. We've been recognised by Moody's and S&P uh, for that, Mr Speaker. Uh, but I must say, if, uh, if New South Wales wants to complain, it's up to them. They are the masters of their own domain, Mr Speaker, and they need to, and they need to manage their own budget responsibly and not, blame, and not blame other states for what they have achieved. Now, I want to be really clear about this. I want to be really clear. New South Wales Liberal Party has launched a campaign against us. They have launched the campaign in their budgets. I expect they'll want other states to join to it so they can point the finger at Western Australia and say that That's is what is responsible uh, for what is going on over there. Now, I just want to say to all the states and all the treasurers across Australia, especially New South Wales, do not take on Western Australia. No. They, will be de they will be declaring war upon this state if they want to go down that direction. This was hard fought for 20 years. Do not try and unwind this deal. We do not want to have a war with you, but if you do, we will go to war with everything at our disposal to protect this deal, Mr Speaker. OK, uh, the member for Churchland, so I was on my feet for about five minutes. Well, no, I was concentrating on him because you was so loud, but all the rest, if you do it again, I'll call you to order. Member for more. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, my question today is to the Minister for Local Government. Minister, I refer to the Legislative Council's disallowance of your changes to Regulation 9.1 of the Local Government Rules of Conduct last week and also to Recommendation 26 of the Select Committee into Local Government, which reads in part, the Government clarify the roles of Council and the Chief Executive and the distinction between governance and operational matters. And I ask, how will you respond to Recommendation 26 to clarify the relationship between CEOs and councillors and strengthen Council's governance functions? Good question. Minister. I thank the uh, member for more for the question. Well, you know, very interestingly, member for more, as you would be aware, in the panel inquiry from the City of Perth, the issues around uh, the importance of uh, uh, clarifying and making sure that elected members understand very clearly their role and responsibility as opposed to the responsibility of a CEO, uh, that the CEO is responsible for the operations of a council and that elected members are not uh, are responsible for the operations of a council, made very clear in the report uh, of the panel inquiry, made very clear in a number of Triple C reports uh, of recent times, uh, again highlighting that uh, there are a number of councils, and particularly elected members, who do not understand the difference between their role as opposed to the CEO. And then, of course, uh, as a result of the uh, panel inquiry uh, to the, um, uh, that uh, was handed down by uh, 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 Mr Tony Power, one of the key recommendations, uh, which was, was of course also taken up by the Select Committee, was to clarify. So what do I do? I clarify by putting forward an amendment to, to, uh, 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 to Reg 9. Reg 9, which of course is where uh, it can be very clearly uh, uh, highlighted or claimed that there is uh, some um, grey areas. So I put up a, an amendment to the other place to clarify, as was expected by and underpinned by the panel inquiry and by the very select committee that reported to the other place, including representatives of your party. And what did your party do, along with some crossbenchers in the other place? Disallowed it. So they disallowed it. So, so, so we attempt to clarify, we attempt to clarify, 
the role and responsibilities. We attempt to clarify, and then what do you go and do with it? You go and vote against it and disallow it. This is a great example of the lack of any policy decision-making and policy uh, uh, deliverance from those opposite. They're very happy to carp. They're very happy to come in here and demonstrate that they don't have any clear understanding of what local governments, uh, the Local Government Act, in fact, the current one, uh, uh, does in terms of uh, uh, delivery of local government in West Australia. That's one of the reasons why this government has embarked on, a, on, a, on a, uh, a reform program, which was not what you, of course, did when you had your eight and a half years in this place. The only thing you did, the only thing you did whilst you were on the other, uh, on the, uh, uh, this side of the house, was a, uh, an ill-fated amalgamation of proposal by the former government. So, I'll keep on, I tell you this, I'll keep on putting reforms up, you can keep knocking them back, but I tell you what, the local government sector needs reform. We've recognised it. We are working our way through towards a Green Bill if we're re-elected at the next election so that we can have a modern piece of legislation that underpins the importance of local government to communities throughout Western Australia. You can sit back and attack, you can sit back and, uh, and carp, but your history shows you do nothing. You do nothing while you're in government with regard to local government, and you criticise and knock out reforms that are important and needed, as you did last week in the upper house. But I'm going to keep going, because it's important that we have reform in local government. And I would think that it would be important for you, member, who asked the question about politicisation of local government. He, he was very concerned about the uh, expert panel's report about politicisation of government. You might remember he asked the question, he said, oh, you know, oh, I see that they want people to declare about their political interests. National the National Party always says this. Yeah. There should be no local. There should be no politics in local government. Well, why would you? Why would you be member afraid for more. of anybody member declaring for more. a member of a political party? You don't have any logic to what you put forward with regard to local government. All you do is criticise. All you do is carp, and you have no reform program at all. Yeah. Supplementary. Yeah. Mr Speaker, uh, Minister, given the disallowance, do you now concede that your failed attempt to prevent councillors from being able to deal with sensitive matters relating to a CEO was an overreach that has created more confusion and uncertainty than existed before? Minister. You're not listening. You're not listening, Member for more. You come in here. You don't listen. The fact of the matter is that place up there, and I don't want to Member make. Member for more, you've I don't had two questions. Any, I want to cast anything, any, any, uh, any Minister, comments. Minister, Member for more, you had two cracks. I'll call your order. For the I don't time. want to uh, cast any uh, <laughs> against the members in the other place. But I tell you what. One member was overheard in another place of saying to, uh, in regards to disallowance, when another member who voted uh, to not uh, disallow, not from the Labor Party, but when he pointed out to the, uh, the member and said, um, you do realise you're a acting uh, uh, um, uh, ultra vires here, and the response was, oh, but it's just politics. Just politics. You see, that's what you do, that's what you do, and that's what the approach is in the other place. But we're happy. We don't, have, we don't have the numbers in the other place. We accept that. We accept that. But the simple fact of the matter is this. The local government system in West Australia needs reform. The Local Government Act is over 20 plus years old. It does not and is not fit for purpose. That's why this government has had a program of reviewing it. That's why we put forward and passed legislation in this place that in, deals with issues around Auditor General being responsible for financial and performance, in, performance measures. We'll keep doing it. We'll keep putting to the people of Western Australia a proposal to reform local government, because it needs to happen. When they go to the election on the 13th of March next year, at least they'll know that we are doing everything possible to, be, to provide a modern piece of legislation and a modern context for local government. We believe in the local government sector. It's an important sector. All you do is carp. All you do is harp on. You do nothing. You would continue to be the hyenas who pick through the bins and, and throw rubbish around and do nothing else. <laughs> Hyenas. <laughs> Member for Belcada. My question is to the Minister for Police. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to keeping Western Australia safe and strong, and I ask, can the Minister update the House on the measures this government has taken to support our police officers in the important work they do in protecting our community? 
Minister for Police. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the member for Balcada for that question? And uh, I also noticed tie cho choice. Is that a, a Balcada football club tie? Uh, what an excellent uh, choice, and what a great, what a great club. And I thank the member for this minister. question on policing. Uh, and what a difference, Mr Speaker, four years makes. What a difference the McGowan government has made with its support of the West Australian Police Force. If we think back to those four years ago, uh, we, we, what we inherited was a mess. We saw crime escalating out of control. We saw meth use increasing on a month-to-month -month basis. And we saw a, metropo a failed metropolitan operating model that had police force split into two teams, the local policing teams and the response teams, and police officers traipsing from one end of the metropolitan area to the others. And, of course, in that last... Uh, in that last uh, budget back in 16-17, uh, uh, we saw a police force that was having to suck up more and more efficiency dividends as they had money cut out of their budget. Well, four years later, uh, what we see is uh, an injection of some $755 million into the police budget. That's right, th over three quarters of a billion dollars. Not only that, uh, we had an opposition that were promising zero extra police. At the election, we promised about uh, 143. We promised the 120 staff, uh, 100 uh, police officers for meth and 20 other staff. We promised 30 uh, for the regional enforcement unit, another 13 to cover the extended hour police stations. And then on top of that, we over-delivered uh, another 10 to support family and domestic violence. Then in April this year, we committed another 150 officers, and uh, in the recent budget, another 800. That takes up us to over 1,100 additional police officers. Uh, a substantial commitment uh, by the McGowan government. But our commitment to keeping Western Australians safe and strong doesn't stop there. It doesn't stop with the extra money and the extra officers uh, and the much better operating model. In addition to that, we've delivered on so many things that our police officers have needed for years. They were calling for stab-proof vests back in 2013. Former gave, government gave them a little mini-trial back in 2015 and put no money on budget. What have we done now? We've allocated $19.2 million to give them personal issue vests so that our police officers are as best protected as they can be. We've also rolled out um, mobile phones, the, the One Force mobile phone, uh, to all of our, uh, our police officers. Uh, Body-worn cameras, again, something uh, that should have been done years ago, delivered on my, by our government. Uh, $20.9 million in funding for those body cameras, better for police, but also uh, better for the general public, because you've got that record of interaction. In addition to that, we've delivered on a number of police stations. Member for Collie, I know, is very grateful for the new police station in Capel, which I note the Liberal Party still don't support. We're delivering a new police and justice co complex at Armadale at a cost of $85 million. Uh, that will be opening, that will be opening uh, next year. Uh, and, and more recently, we've committed to the Fremantle Police Complex at a cost of over $52 million, uh, something again that the, uh, the Liberal Party failed to deliver on over all that time. We've protected our police officers as best we can against COVID-19. We've put those extra laws in place. We've introduced a police redress scheme uh, to to recognise those people who were forced to leave uh, medically retired and got no form of redress under, the fo under any former government. We've also taken those medical retirements out of uh, Section 8 of the Police Act and removed that indignity from our officers. Mr Speaker, it is a very long list uh, of uh, supports that we've put in place for our police force uh, and uh, we've seen the results for it. Compared with the peak of the 15-16 crime rave of the Barnett-Harvey era, 
There were a massive 28,000 fewer offences in 1920 uh, than what there were in 1617. That's a 10% across the board uh, reduction. And in terms of the wastewater uh, drug testing, that that's done nationally, not by us, but nationally, we've seen the lowest levels of meth consumption in the last quarter since testing began. Um, metropolitan Perth consumption more than 60% lower than what it was at the end of 2016. So, uh, the Mayor, I thank the Premier and the team for their strong support of our police officers, for their support of our police so that they can keep West Australia safe, strong and protected. Well uh, the Member for Dorsville. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my question to the Minister for Mental Health. The Minister, I refer to the recently released Productivity Commission report into mental health, and I ask, in relation to Western Australia, can you confirm that the report states, and I quote, that there are community ambulatory wor workforce shortages for children and adolescent services and older person services? And if so, Minister, what are the reasons for those shortfalls? Minister for Health. Well, Mr Speaker, as the member will be aware, the Productivity Commission Report is an examination of mental health services and policy right around the country. Uh, it is an extensive report and the government is yet to, um, to form a view in terms of its findings. So obviously we, we welcome any opportunity to continue to examine how we can better improve mental health services in the community, how we can improve the services, how we can build the workforce that sits behind those services and at, most importantly, Mr Speaker, how we can improve the lives of those people who are impacted by mental mental health issues. And as the Prime Minister said, Mr Speaker, groundbreaking data shows that the poor mental health and suicide cost the country $200 billion a year. So there is an opportunity, uh, Mr Speaker, not just to, to look at the, uh, obviously the expense of providing these services, it's the opportunity to look at the expense of not providing these services. And um, that's one of the reasons, Mr Speaker, why uh, Western Australia, uh, the McGowan government, has now invested record levels of, of investment in, uh, in mental health services, including for the first time the mental health budget being over a billion dollars over a billion dollars, Mr Speaker. But uh, the sad thing, Mr Speaker, is that ultimately it will not be enough. We will continue to be challenged, uh, not only by the uh, high level of acuity and complexity of adult uh, mental health patients that are impacting on OEDs, but also, Mr Speaker, young people, adolescents and people under the age of 12 are emerging as a huge challenge for our mental health services. It's one that we all have to challenge, we'll all have to uh, meet uh, together. And uh, we have our mental health plan 2015-2025, uh, 20, 20, which is um, a, a, a pathway for uh, mental health services in Western Australia. It's funding agnostic, Mr Speaker. It calls on funding from both the federal and the state governments. And together, I'm sure, working with the federal government, we can fight a better future for mental health services in Western Australia. Supplementary member for Dawson. Thank you very much, Speaker. Minister, when will you pay attention? Well, when will you respond to the Productivity Commission's report and to the sector and to the own, your own plan that you just cited there that shows that we need to increase the level of funding in not just outpatient services but community based services for young people and older people in Western Australia? Well, Mr Speaker, I think the member will find if he reviews Hansard that I just answered his supplementary before he, before he got to his feet, and that is that we are continuing to fund more mental health services than ever before through record growth in our funding, and we do have the plan for mental health services, Mr Speaker. Um, it's a plan which was uh, 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 struck under the previous government, and it's a, it's, a, it's a plan that we are committed to as well. But it's not just the responsibility of the state government, despite our record investment, we need to have the Commonwealth working with us to make sure that we have an adequate level of services in our community. Thank you. Member for Mirabuka. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. I refer to the Gallagher Government's commitment to keeping Western Australia safe and strong and ensuring patients get the high-quality treatment they need. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on how this Government's legislative reforms are ensuring that patients are put first and are provided with dignified, High quality health care. Minister for Health. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for the question. Um, it's an area of, of government uh, service delivery that she is highly committed to, and I um, very much uh, thank her for the question. And despite the global pandemic, Mr. Speaker, the McGowan government has continued to work hard on its legislative commitments to the people of Western Australia. 
And through this hard work, we have seen a range of pieces of legislation go through this place, Mr Speaker, which I think places uh, uh, the, uh, the needs of patients front and centre. In particular, Mr Speaker, the, uh, the Future Health Research and Innovation Fund legislation, which uses the interest from the, the Future Fund uh, to improve health research, commercialisation and innovation. The passing of this legislation is a win for health and medical research and innovation sector in WA. And through health and medical research, innovation and commercialisation, we'll find new and better ways to treat and prevent disease and create healthier communities. We are building a, a workforce of excellence. We are diversifying our economy. We are making sure that patients receive the very best health care by taking advantage of great medical research taking place in this state. And medical research in Western Australia is in a very poor state. We receive a very small portion of the national medical research funding and it's important that we utilise this funding to make sure that we can improve the lives of Western Australians by having more medical research, commercialisation and other work in the innovation sector taking place in WA. And Mr Speaker, the amendments to the Public Health Act um, brought, um, and the School Education Act brought about the Public Health Amendment Immunisation Requirements for Enrolment Bill, otherwise known as No Jab, No Play legislation, Mr Speaker. This is groundbreaking uh, legislation that all states committed themselves to, which is about, about making sure that we can better support young families who have children entering the education system to ensure that they get the support they need to make sure their kids are fully vaccinated. And Mr Speaker, we now know, you know, I think there's a greater appreciation Appreciation right across the globe, more so than ever, that vaccinations save lives. And if we get to the point, Mr Speaker, where early next year we find a, a vaccine for the COVID-19, I'm sure everyone will agree that it's time that we set aside these arguments around that the anti-vaxxers put, put into the public domain and all, and all commit to making sure we keep our community safe. Mr Speaker, the voluntary assisted dying legislation 2019 is obviously a landmark piece of legislation for WA. We are now only the second state in Australia to legislate for this end of life choice and I and the government are exceptionally proud of this achievement. The Act provides a compassionate and safe legal framework that the community has sought for many years and it reflects extensive consultation and con that was conducted right across the state, Mr Speaker. The implementation of this Act is underway through the work of an expert team supported by WA Health and led by Dr Scott Blackwell. This significant piece of legislation will become operable in July 2021. And Mr Speaker, can I just acknowledge the great work of the Joint Select Committee on End of Life Choices, uh, chaired by the member for Morley, the expert uh, panel led by Mr Malcolm McCusker, and the ongoing work of the End of Life Care Team at WA Health. But Mr Speaker, we also undertook other um, ongoing reform in the health sector. We know, Mr Speaker, that tobacco remains the leading cause of preventable death in Australia and is estimated to kill 19,000 Australians each year. So the changes, Mr Speaker, that we made to the Tobacco Products Control Act um, uh, were a significant step forward uh, of, of the ongoing process of tobacco law reform in this, in this state. <laughs> In particular, our, our changes, Mr Speaker, focused on young people, making sure that young people were not tempted by the marketing of tobacco companies to ensure that they get hooked early in life and then can struggle to get off this, this insidious this serious drug. Mr Speaker, in the eight and a half years of the, of the, the Barnett Liberal Go National Government, not one piece of legislation reformed the Tobacco Products Control Act were put through. They left it, they left it to the work of an independent member. Uh, the, the, of the independent, the independent member Janet um, Woolard to actually put through this legislation. And Mr Speaker, in, a, in an exercise in playing catch up, we are currently doing a review of the current Act in its current form to see what future changes can be made to this legislation in 2021 if the people of Western Australia um, re elect the McGowan Labor government. 
And on the subject, Mr Speaker, of future legislation, safe access zones. A proposal for a reform uh, was put forward, Mr Speaker, and we brought this legislation as quickly as we could to this place. I'm very pleased that the, that the Assembly saw fit to support this legislation without even seeing the need to divide, Mr Speaker. So I assume, that, um, I assume Mr Speaker, that all members will be staying united after the election when we recommit this legislation, regardless of who gets elected. Um, and, I'd like, and we look forward to any government, given the unanimous support that was enjoyed by this legislation right across the chamber. I look forward to any government returned after the election recommitting this legislation so we can pass it as quickly as possible to improve the lives of women who are seeking sexual, uh, legal uh, sexual health services uh, right across this state. I read that somewhere. Uh, the member for Geraldton. My question is to the Minister for Community Services. Minister, I refer to the media statement dated 6 November 2020 about the Target 120 Early Intervention Program, recently expanded to Geraldton, which states that you are working with a range of departments, including the Department of Education, and I ask, how is your department working with education to encourage and enforce school attendance in Geraldton? In Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I don't know whether uh, the member paid much attention to the Target 120 um, publicity or the, uh, I think I did a, um, a question during question time recently, but Target 120, uh, as the name implies, is a very concentrated program. So it works with identified families in a concentrated way to get better outcomes for the young people in those families um, and hopefully uh, other members of the family, the siblings and, and the parents. Um, so I explained in a question um, to this House in question time, question asked of me, that the program is uh, working with young people aged 10 to uh, 14 and their families. And in Geraldton in the last year, we've worked uh, at the moment, I think it's about 10 young people and their families. And we're starting to get some very good outcomes around the state. But in the case of Geraldton, uh, by memory, I think there was 77% of those young people have had no new offences. And uh, overall, there's been a 99% reduction uh, in, in offences, uh, in offending for those young people. Um, I didn't have the data to hand on school attendance, but that's certainly uh, one of the criteria. That'll be one of the uh, measures that we'll use uh, to guide the success or otherwise of the program. So the, uh, the program is, is working with those identified young people, but it is not designed to look at school attendance across the board. It is working in the case of, those, of the Geraldton program with 10 young people. Uh, so I'm happy to get you some data de-identified data on what's happening with their school attendance, but it, it is not designed to work more generally on, uh, on school attendance. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, have you discussed the reintroduction of Education Department truancy officers with the Education Minister to help reduce recidiv recidivism and improve school attendance for... That's not a supplementary. That's not part of the <laughs> Member for Kimberley. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Fisheries. I refer to the McGowan Labor Government's commitment to growing WA's aquaculture industry and creating new jobs in the sector as our economy recovers from the impacts of COVID-19. And I ask, can the Minister outline to the House how the Aquaculture Development Plan announced today will help attract new investments in the industry and support the creation of new local WA jobs? Thank you. Good thank, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, thank the member for Kimberley for, uh, for that and your enduring interest actually in agriculture for the pearling industry, particularly and Barramundi and your, uh, your electorate. Um, the, the situation West Australia finds itself in now is that we are at a turning point. The aquaculture industry in Western Australia, after many, many years of people talking about it and successive governments attempting to talk about it and do something about it, uh, there is a moment in time now, and delivered by COVID,
but also delivered in large part by the fact that the fiscal discipline of the first three years of this government uh, and the way we've approached the health crisis in, in front of us has allowed us to refocus and redouble our efforts in, uh, in taking the agriculture industry to, towards its potential. And yesterday I was very delighted to launch the Agriculture Development Plan for Western Australia uh, to expand our uh, blue economy, if you like, and track new investment and uh, up to as many 6,000 jobs in its mature form. That's 6,000 sustainable jobs well over the horizon and into the future. Uh, the agriculture plan focus of, of work needs to accelerate and support the continued growth of the agriculture industry to, to uh, make sure it's well positioned to build on the opportunities as we come out of COVID-19 and reopen the international economy. And it's fundamentally important that we, we take the time and are not idle in this moment while we're trying to create or are creating the best possible opportunity. The reason being is Western Australia, with its 12,500 kilometres of coastline, extremely prospective areas for agriculture, is actually internationally attractive for foreign direct investment. Making sure we, we get those sort of areas identified uh, uh, and as much as possible de-risk them and get them to the international markets fundamental to the growth of Western Australia. At full production, um, the existing agriculture zones will, in fact, be the largest agriculture zones in Australia and in some, some species in the Southern Hemisphere. The, hatch, the uh, Oyster Harbour uh, leases, about 500 hectares that I released recently, put to the market, is the first tranche of nearly 1,000 hectares of a highly prospective oyster farming location down in Albany will make it the largest single oyster production facility in the Southern Hemisphere. And that is in large part been able to be delivered because the government committed to common user infrastructure that was beyond the capacity of any one commercial operator. Very the millions good. of dollars that was uh, injected into the shellfish hatchery in, uh, in Albany uh, has actually exceeded expectations to the point that we need to accelerate the expansion of its capability to deliver to a hungry industry with highly corporatised approaches to it to ensure that we are keeping pace with industry. So the agricultural development zone itself is a very exciting thing to, to launch. We're looking forward to the conclusion of the EOI process there. Uh, to support this potential, though, right across the coastline, right up into the Kimberleys, uh, from all the way down from the, the bite all the way around, uh, we've done a lot since 2017. Done a lot. And there's a lot more to do there, member. Uh, declare, we declared the Midwest Agricultural Development Zone, which has since been fully allocated. The FinFish transferred the Australian Centre for Applied Aquaculture Research to the Department of Prime Industries and Regional Development to, under the MOG arrangements, which have accelerated its research capability. We funded the construction and operation of Marine Fin Fish Nursery in Geraldton in partnership with the Agriculture Council of Western Australia, established the Albany Shellfish Hatteries I mentioned, progressed the establishment of agriculture development zones in the south coast with a focus on to. Albany, upgrade the Waterman's Bay. I know to. you don't like hearing you it. To. I know you don't like hearing it. I know you don't like hearing it, but we didn't talk about it. Since 2017, yes, these things have been delivered by a government that actually cares about the outcome. Um, members on this side saying about taking too long, they forget when they are on that side for their answers. Minister. So those expectations of Western Australians for a job, for a sustainable job, not just for their kids but their children's children. This government gives them the opportunity to involve themselves in a highly technical industry that will sustain their ability. Now, if I take too long, I apologise. I apologise, but the litany of successes of this government need to be articulated in this place so you people get an understanding of, of what good government looks like. Because you did it in eight years, you didn't do it now, and I'm going to continue. We provided $3.9 million of funding for an agriculture stimulus package. The Deep Herd Hillary Shellfish Research Facility. We provided a declaration of the Albany Development Zone, release of administrative guidelines for the agriculture leases, make them more internationally competitive, the completion of the design component of the Geraldton Marine Finfish Nursery in September of this year, accelerated it. We launched the agriculture development plan, so we have the actually have a blueprint for people who want to see an opportunity for their children. And I'm a gown governor delivered it because we had the opportunity to have a vision you had no idea about. No more. You're member for Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Water. 
I refer to your response to my question on notice and I ask, can you confirm that the total number of staff in the Water Corporation has increased from 2,654 in 2016 to 3,429 in 2020, an increase of 775 or 29 per cent? Minister. Um, Members. Again, um, Thank you, uh, thank you, Member for Cottesloe, for the question. Um, congratulations on getting two in a calendar year. Um, <laughs> but I'm, it's, uh, I'm very pleased that you've managed to get yourself up the up the totem pole to that. Uh, look, uh, sorry. No, they don't trust you with more. There's always th tomorrow or, or when we come back. Members, Member, Member for Cottesloe, um, I'm really pleased that you asked me that question. There has, in fact, been an increase in the number of staff at the Water Corporation. Um, you may, you may, it may have missed your attention that under this government we have bought back in house a number of services that were privatised under previous yeah. Liberal governments. There was members. a, a, members. a uh, essentially maintenance uh, for uh, metropolitan operations was privatised under the court Liberal government, I think back in 1997, I think it was. Uh, and uh, under this government, we bought that work back in house. So that was about 250 uh, staff who are so happy now to be back and members of the uh, employed directly by the Water Corporation. Uh, I went to a morning tea that the Water Corporation put on for to celebrate those staff coming back in house. And I remember one one gentleman came up to me and said. He had worked for the Water Corporation, as he saw it, for over 40 years. He'd started with the Water Authority and then his job had been privatised. He'd essentially done the same job, but the logo had changed on his shirt. He'd seen contractors come and go. He was now, he said, in a position where he could proudly retire as a directly employed member, uh, employee of the Water Corporation. That was the mood at, at that morning tea. People worked hard, but they were proud that they were finally again being recognised as direct employees of the Water Corporation. In addition to that, there was a contract, the Aruna Alliance, uh, which I think was let in 2012, uh, again by the previous court, Liberal government, uh, not uh, Barnett Liberal government. That, that was operating a lot of our wastewater treatment plants, uh, the, the dams, those sort of, uh, that sort of activity, those major uh, bits of infrastructure. I think it was about 400 uh, staff came back into the Water Corporation's direct employees uh, at the time. So a member for Cottesloe, and again, I went to a similar morning tea uh, for, uh, uh, for that group when they came in, and they were suitably chuffed, suitably chuffed, that we think on this side of the house that the work that they do for the public of Western Australia is so important that uh, they can be now directly employed by the Water Corporation. And I've got to say, when we were hit with COVID-19 and the Water Corporation had to quickly uh, alter the way it managed a lot of those services, having those staff directly employed, directly at their uh, direct line of sight, was of great assistance. So, Member Crosso, yes, you're right, there's been an increase in the staff at the Water Corporation, largely due to those two contracts coming back in house, and they are decisions I'm very proud of. Supplementary. Members. Minister, can you confirm that you care more about growing union membership than you do about. No, no, it's not a supplement. It is Come not on. a supplement. <laughs> Members! <laughs> Members! So I understand that a supplementary question should relate to the original question that was asked. The member for Cottesloe was asking a question about the workforce. It was indeed related to the It's not a point of order. That's the end of question time. Shush. Yes. Mr. Speaker, understanding my objection to such 
section two, uh, questions on notice, which is one of the uh, chances for the government to be transparent in their processes. Uh, the, Premier, the Premier has an outstanding question, question 6370, which I have already asked the Premier to respond to a month ago, and now it's outstanding two months later. Premier, why has that not been answered, and when will it be answered? Uh, member, what's it about? Uh, it's, a, it's about putting caps on people coming into Western Australia. Uh, well, I'll endeavour to find out. Member for Nederlands. Call two, and my question is to the Minister for Innovation. I've got you've got two outstanding questions: number six four five seven and six four five six. When can I expect an answer, Minister? They're not outstanding. Um, I will endeavour to get an answer for you as soon as I can. <laughs> Member for Vash. Uh, under uh, section 80, subsection 2, I have an outstanding question which was to the Minister for Health. Uh, the outstanding question number is 6495, and I'm just uh, wondering if that uh, question can be answered. Yep. Mr Speaker, there have been a range of questions from Member for Vass that we've answered, so I'm surprised we haven't got onto it, but I'll grab it and get it to you as quickly as possible. Member for Needlands. I have another question outstanding from the Minister for Local Government. Question number 6471. Uh, can I, will I expect an answer before Parliament resumes, Minister? I, I, I will endeavour to make sure you get that answer to that question as soon as possible. Oh, Member for Nederland, you're busy today. Uh, I have a, uh, actually the outstanding question is to the Minister for Transport. I asked the Premier if uh, the Premier could uh, chase up the Minister for Transport on, on my behalf to find out the, when the answer to question number 6474 will be answered. Uh, again, Premier. I'll endeavour to do this. Hoover, what's it about, Member? Uh, the Premier's asking what the question is about, Mr. Speaker, so I'll respond. You, you may answer. Thank you. The question is about the, the actual number of uh, train movements between Bayswater Railway Station and, 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 uh, and Claremont, uh, uh, Speaker, mm. and I understand that it's trebled because of the actual uh, uh, the, the line. No, no I, just, I, I just want the question. No, no, he's not answering the question. He's telling the Premier what the question is. So he doesn't have to answer it. So That's confirm... enough. We've got the gist. Yeah, got the gist. I will okay. endeavour to find out about train movements on the railways. <laughs> members, members, members. Uh, I wish to advise that I've approved the presence of media this afternoon to take photographs of the Treasurer delivering his valedictory speech. They asked me this question yesterday, but I wasn't sure if he changed his mind, so I didn't answer them until this morning. <laughs> and I'm very disappointed they're not staying for the Speaker's valedictory. Uh, right. Uh, no MPA, uh, government business orders of the day.